So hello everyone again. Um, we've had some major problems with uh, Google Hangouts on this particular one. We're pretty sure it's not our fault. Um, so we've had to do this the old-fashioned way and basically just record over Skype. Um, this will be uploaded a bit later both on SoundCloud and, uh, and YouTube. So first of all, um, I'd like to introduce Mike Virchuk, who is an associate professor at the University of Sydney and who has been very patient with all this technical um, rubbish. So Mike, thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure. Technology is uh, you know, our friend and our enemy and it's certainly not your fault. No. Well, hopefully it'll be fixed up in time for the next, uh, for the next live stream, but uh, we'll have to see what happens. Um, so, Mike, you're an experimentalist working uh, particularly with iron trap technology. Um, you're our only second experimentalist, I think, uh, after Jeremy, who works on linear optics. So, as usual, I sort of like to to try and introduce people by sort of giving, letting them give us sort of a bit of a background as to how they got into to this particular field and what got them interested in quantum information. Yeah, so my, um, I guess my path is a bit uh, circuitous and unusual. I came uh, from an experimental background where I had done research in you know, mesoscopic physics, uh, experimental condensed matter associated with, uh, with making spin qubits. Uh, this was uh, in the lab of Charlie Marcus at Harvard. Um, but then after I graduated, I uh, took a detour from academia and went to an agency called DARPA, uh, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which is focused on developing new technologies of all sorts, and um, worked there for a few years uh, as a full-time consultant, helping DARPA start up uh, their efforts in funding quantum information, uh, but also other topics like um, advanced microprocessor architecture, which was really exciting to get to learn computer science at a very deep level. And uh, following that, and uh, actually through that role, I got to know Dave Weinland, uh, and uh, then moved to join his group as a um, kind of independently post, uh, funded postdoc. Uh, I was supported by some intelligence agencies um, in that uh, in that time, and spent a few years becoming an iron trapper uh, at the iron storage group at NIST, and uh, thereafter established my own uh, research team here at Sydney. So, was iron trap technology always something that you were focused on, or have you sort of come at it since your time at DARPA and sort of decided that this is what I wanted to get into? Well, uh, I mean, having a background in experimental condensed matter, uh, no, I definitely did not have iron traps or even atomic physics uh, on my radar uh, when I was younger. Um, I was broadly interested in experimental physics and in quantum physics. Um, when I was at DARPA, a lot of my effort was on quantum information, which was something that you know, as a grad student, you heard about and you used a little bit in terms of motivation, but that's quite different than saying, you know, let's really learn this and, and think about how to, for instance, build systems. Uh, that inspiration came through my time at DARPA, and uh, you know, the real questions that I got interested in related to the control of quantum systems. Mm -hmm. So my PhD research, while it was kind of focused on developing spin qubits. Uh, really was device engineering. It was trying to build nanoscale electronic devices that would give you access to single spin. So I was working in the field at a time when you know this was not routine in, in semiconductor systems. Uh, ion traps were very appealing. Uh, first of all, I got to know Dave, and he's probably the most lovely human being in the universe. So uh, so I'm I'm very pleased that I got the opportunity to work with him. But also, ions were a great platform because. Uh, this technology is quite mature in terms of general coherent control capabilities, mm -hmm. and it was a uh, you know at the time this was two thousand eight that I was that I was starting in Dave's group. Uh, it was really an excellent time to start thinking about more intricate uh, quantum control experiments, and you obviously needed a, a serious platform, and ions were were the best choice at the time. So I mean, we we had a bit of a chat that will be uploaded next week with with Seth Lloyd. And he, uh, he was talking about sort of how NMR quantum computing developed from the existing technology that led to MRI machines. Uh, in your particular case and in Dave's particular case with ion traps, the technology kind of evolved out of atomic clocks. So maybe give us a rundown of sort of, you know, the, the five minute history of how ion trap quantum computing, you know, came to be. Uh, yeah, so I, I won't pretend this is the definitive history, but I will give uh, you know a high-level overview. Uh, I, you're quite correct in that a lot of the background uh, in terms of technology and capability and even motivation associ was associated with uh, clock development. So look, NIST is an agency that's focused on time and frequency metrology. Dave Weinland is in the time and frequency group, uh, and he is 
broadly or has been broadly interested in questions of precision timekeeping using ions. So that is, instead of the neutral atom clocks that people make for the cesium uh, standard, looking to make uh, clocks that use single confined ions uh, or small collections of ions. And that research really was developing in the, in the early 1990s. Uh, and then into the mid-90s, they were thinking about using uh, entanglement as a way to suppress noise in, in clocks, to, to make better clocks. Uh, and at just about the same time, uh, it emerged uh, that you know, if you could build a computer that used quantum mechanical effects in a certain way, then you could have access to uh, solving certain problems of great interest, for instance, Shor's algorithm. And uh, you know, at the time, the ion trap community was very well poised to transition a lot of the techniques that were developed for, for instance, making different kinds of clocks that might use entanglement uh, towards these problems in quantum information. And then, you know, the rest, as they say, is history. Uh, a lot has happened since the mid-1990s with the first quantum logic gates, uh, the, de you know, demonstration of non-classical states of motion of a, of a quantum harmonic oscillator in the form of a single trapped ion, uh, all the way through to the multi-qubit entanglements, uh, experiments, the um, uh, demonstration in, I guess, 2009 of uh, complete control over a two-qubit quantum processor, and then since then, many of these exciting developments in quantum simulation. Uh, all with this background, uh, as you indicated, in the techniques, technology, uh, and even motivation associated with clocks. So, I mean, in terms of the technology itself, um, what is the qubit? I mean, we, we've talked about qubits in, in linear optics, we've talked about qubits in superconducting systems. In your particular system, what, what is the, the quantum bit? I mean, quite broadly in ion trapping, you use an internal transition of a particular species uh, of atom. Uh, in my lab, we focus on two different atoms. One is ytterbium, uh, and in that there's a transition near 12 and a half gigahertz, and that's quite convenient because there is a huge amount of, um, of infrastructure there. It's in the satellite communications band, so you can buy quite a lot of advanced telecom hardware that gives you the ability to put out microwaves resonant with that transition to drive it and manipulate the two-level system. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition, we use beryllium, uh, which is uh, the ion species favored by, by Ness Boulder, uh, but we use that for a very different kind of experiment with penning traps where we have uh, a transition in the many tens of gigahertz, about 50, 56 gigahertz, uh, that again we can control with microwaves. It's a, it, once again, it's just an internal electronic transition of the single valence electron. So we call them iron traps because you, you, that's what you're literally doing. I mean, you're, you're taking an iron and you're, you're trapping it, aren't you? Yeah, that's quite correct. I mean, it's, it's a really beautiful bit of technology that was developed by uh, great leaders in the field of atomic physics. And, and, you know, Dave was a great contributor to the development of traps for single ions. Uh, broadly, you think of these as a, an electromagnetic bottle. It's a, um, it's a confining potential that you make using... Uh, electromagnetic fields in one kind that's very common uh, called a Paul trap. You use radio frequency fields. So imagine uh, a, a set of signals applied to electrodes at about a hundred megahertz and about a hundred volts. Right? That's that's the rough order of magnitude that we're talking about. Sorry, Mike Hughesville. Um, and uh, I was too excited. Uh, and and with these kinds of electromagnetic fields, you can form. Uh, a confining potential for a charged particle. Uh, it happens to be what's called a quadrupole potential, so it's a little bit like a saddle. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the trickery here is, is quite beautiful physics, that uh, there are basic theorems in electromagnetism that say you can't confine a charged particle with static electric fields. And uh, so to get around that, you make a field that fluctuates in time. It makes a saddle and if you imagine a saddle, there's one direction that's confining and one that's anti-confining. So if you were to put a ball on a saddle, it would just roll down the hill. Mm -hmm. the, the trickery is that you spin the saddle on a time scale faster than the ball can roll down the hill. And so by the time it starts to go down the hill, it's suddenly looking uphill, and then it tries to go the other way, and then it's suddenly looking uphill again. Ah, okay. uh, this is by applying radio frequency fields, as I said, you know, of water 100 megahertz, but it varies by species. Um, Doesn't this cause a lot of noise in the cube? Well, so the, the 100 volts, 100 megahertz is quite far away from any resonant transition, typically, uh, but there is noise associated with um, the motion of the ions. So there are all sorts of things that we do in order to very tightly control uh, the vibration, the motion of the atoms, like imagine a, a marble in a bowl and you want it to sit very still at the bottom. Uh, the presence of these big electric fields can uh, certainly disturb that 
Um, but but in terms of the internal transitions, you're far off resonant. So the first ideas with, with iron trapping when they sort of came out in the mid '90s was um, the, these sort of linear arrays of, of irons. Now you, you've talked about the, the the qubit itself as being these two internal transitions that you can hit with microwaves and do single qubit gates. Um, how do you do multi qubit operations in this system? Yeah, this was something that honestly uh, really blew my mind a little bit when I got into learning about the field many years ago. Uh, you know, as you mentioned, there's an internal state of an atom, and that internal state is something you can access using lasers or microwaves or whatever is appropriate for the for the energy associated with your transition. But how you make that talk to another atom is uh, is not so straightforward. Um, if you think of it as a spin, and then you go back to basic physics and you say, "Oh well, spins talk to each other by a dipole interaction." Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out that the Coulomb force, the, re the repulsion, just because the atoms are charged, is so large that, for the most part, this, the direct spin-spin coupling is negligible. It's just too small to, to matter, although people have measured it, like Roeo uh, mm -hmm. But uh, what we do instead is we have to engineer a connection, a, a, an interaction between the atoms. And we do that by leveraging the fact that they'll sit in a shared potential. So imagine a bowl with... Two, mar two marbles in it, and they'll oscillate together, and they may oscillate together in what's called the center of mass mode, or they may bounce off one another in something called the stretch mode. By accessing uh, the fact that in quantum mechanics the motion can be, can be quantized, like the harmonic oscillator, mm -hmm. you can actually map the spin degree of freedom, that is your qubit state, to motion, and the motion will be shared between atoms. So you take the spin excitation, if you like, of one atom, you map it into the shared motion, and then you map it back to the spin of the other one. That's very cartoonish, but this motion is used as a bus that mediates the interaction between the spins. And it's done using, using light fields generally, um, that you can induce uh, what are called AC Stark shifts that are state selective. That's the technical detail of how it works. So basically the coupling operation is done through their motion. Sort of like a, yes. a Newton's cradle kind of arrangement and how one influences the other, but obviously quantum mechanically. Yeah, in almost all cases, that's how it's done. Right. So, I mean, where's the where's sort of the state of the art at the moment in terms... I mean, so obviously I, I talk about in the context of computing because that, that's what I'm interested in. Um, so where are, where are iron traps now, uh, especially compared to other technologies such as uh, superconducting, NV, or the other stuff that's done in Sydney, namely the, the silicon quantum computer? Yeah, so ions have been you know, in the lead, if you will, in, in many respects for many years. And that's obviously because there's this very long history of technology development in, in AMO physics and atomic physics. So these first quantum gates were realized in the late 1990s or the mid-1990s. Uh, and since then, there have been tremendous advances. Uh, right now, the state of the art in, in quantum computing is that you know, Reiner Blatt's group, uh, which really pushes very hard on... Um, advancing the absolute capability of control over trapped ions uh, has of order 20 individual ions, each with independent control. And they can execute algorithms uh, using a subset of them. I think it's you know up to 15 or so they've demonstrated, but they're ever expanding. Mm -hmm. um, and my group collaborates with, with Reiner on a, on a US funded uh, effort. And uh, you know, what we bring is a little bit different than just advancing the state of the art and the technology, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, there's been a lot of development in uh, quantum simulation. So Chris Monroe's team has done beautiful experiments uh, making uh, kind of an analog computer. Uh, so it's a different kind of quantum computer that just mimics uh, some interacting state in, in say, solid-state physics with, with uh, about a dozen ions, maybe a little bit more. And, and in collaboration with NIST, a few years ago, we published a paper uh, in a penning trap using ion crystals in a, in a different kind of trap uh, that had up to 300 independent spins that were all coupled together. We didn't have ind individual control in that case, but we were able to execute very, very simple uh, calculations, if we can use that loose term, mm -hmm. uh, in order to perform simulations of quantum magnetism. So that's a very big system with less control, but the state of the art in terms of absolute control is about 20 ions. and. Um, you know, that's, that's quite a ways in advance of uh, other technologies like, um, uh, like semiconductors. Uh, superconducting circuits have risen very rapidly. There's been tremendous progress 
overcoming technical challenges. Um, they're catching up very rapidly with ions. I think semiconductors have a ways to go, but on the other side, uh, many of the questions associated with how do you build a large-scale system using, say, trapped ions or whatever other technology, they're much easier to answer, at least in the abstract, when you talk about nanoscale semiconductor devices or even superconducting circuits on chip. It's much harder when you think about how do you build a really big ion trap system. Um, but that said, uh, I, I think very few people have any really clear understanding of exactly what uh, the ultimate winner will be if you, if you want to use that. I think it's a completely open-ended question. Well, yeah. I mean, I've always advocated in the idea that uh, talking about a winner is, is not the, the right way to look at it. Every system has its place. And iron traps are, are very highly developed, but they could suffer from problems in being quite large and being quite slow. Um, yeah, absolutely. And if you if you want to look to history, which has great lessons about this, um, you know, the ENIAC was the world's first uh, electrical computer, um, and that was a system built using vacuum tubes in, mm -hmm. in the late 1940s. Um, some people have compared ion traps to vacuum tubes, right? Um, ultimately, we don't have vacuum tube-based computers in our in our pocket or in our laptop, but it's impossible to deny that ENIAC was a major watershed moment in the development of electrical computing. Yeah. And it may well be that ions play a similar role. Uh, I honestly don't know. Uh, but also it's worth noting that you know, we used to um, always rely on what we call macroscopic traps, traps that are really pieces of metal that we screw together and, and whatnot. We still do that for lots of experimental purposes. But uh, Dave, uh, Dave Weinland pioneered the, the notion of chip-based traps. Um, so making traps using microfabrication techniques, and, and since those initial experiments in the uh, in the you know, around 2005, there's been a global effort at places like Sandia National Labs, Georgia Tech Research Institute, and recently Honeywell to take that to a new level of maturity. And now the best traps you can get, I mean broadly speaking, are these microfabricated traps. So the idea of something where you maybe have ions, but it's in fact coupled to a chip. Um, you know, that even a little bit hybrid architecture is, uh, is very much on the cards these days. So, I mean, what kind of size are we talking about? Because when people think of quantum computing, you know, we're sort of talking about, you know, computing with atoms and stuff like that. So people naturally assume that these things are going to be really, really small. Now, in your case, yes, you are computing with individual atoms, but they're not small because they sort of live in this, as you said, with these, these chips. Um, that means that while the qubit itself might be very small, the sort of neighborhood that it lives in actually does take up quite a lot of space. So what kind of sizes are we talking about in iron trap technology? Well, so the, the first size scale that matters is how far apart are the ions. Um, you know, the ion itself has a wave function that may extend over you know, 10 nanometers or so in space based on the confining potential. Uh, but the ions, because they repel each other quite strongly, sit far apart. And that, that spacing is of order microns. So by nanofabrication standards, that's reasonably big. Um, that's kind of older generation technology of, of microprocessor uh, microlithography. Um, but then the ions, if we're talking about a chip trap, which is generally quite compact, um, the ions have to sit of order tens of microns above the surface mm -hmm. or away from the electrodes. And so that sets the overall scale of how big all the electrodes and everything else has to be. Everything has to be... Uh, size to be compatible with ion separations and uh, ion electrode separations of order tens of microns. Uh, accordingly, on a chip, uh, there, I mean, there were some beautiful experiments from Sandia of uh, about 100 ions in a ring-shaped uh, electrode geometry. Um, it's a very beautiful demonstration, but in terms of overall qubit density, it's not as high as you might expect for, um, or as you might hope for in, uh, in a semiconductor system. Uh, in addition, you also have all of the supporting infrastructure, all the laser systems, all the ultra-high vacuum chambers, and those things can be quite big. So you have to think a whole optical table filled with lasers and things uh, coupled to the ultimate physical package, which is, which is quite a bit smaller. Um, now, that may seem uh, you know, distressing that you're talking about whole optics tables. Mm -hmm. First thing to say is it's no different for any other technology. Uh, if you're talking about semiconductor systems, you have a whole dilution refrigerator and all the pumps and things that are roughly the same volume as an optics table with associated things. But it's also really exciting that in the, in the broader AMO community, 
there have been big advances in, for instance, chip scale atomic clocks. So these are atomic clocks that are extremely compact, uh, that are you know cubic centimeter scales, uh, with all the integrated electronics and packaging and, and optics. And so there is a hope that in the future you may be able to do similar scaling uh, with ion trap based technology. So I mean, the infrastructure certainly around having an optics bench, yes, has the potential to be miniaturized. But this sort of fundamental le- length scale that you talked about, this sort of micron separation between ions, this 10 micron sort of hovering above the top of the chip. Um, Is there any pathway to miniaturize that or is that really kind of a hard limit when it comes to uh, the size of these things? Well, you can certainly push down to micron scale and you do this by having tighter confinement. But to do that, the voltages get bigger or the ions have, you know, there are a bunch of trade-offs in the the way you do the trapping. Uh, That means that I I don't expect you're going to get much uh, tighter spatial confinement than this this micron scale. Um, but to be fair, if you look at the device geometries for even nanofabricated semiconductor spin qubits, if you count all the gates that are used, the electrodes that are used to uh, make the confining potential, um, to route wires to the outside world, you're not actually that different than a pitch of, of microns or tens of microns. Mm-hmm. So there's some kind of fundamental similarity. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it seems as though sort of the micron scale, because of all the infrastructure that it has to sit around a cube, it seems to be the, the limiting step at this point for most technologies. Quite right. I mean, to be, to be clear, it's much, much bigger in, in, semi, in, uh, excuse me, in superconductors where the overall geometry is set, for instance, by these resonant cavities, where if you're in the, in the microwave, you're talking about you know, many millimeters or centimeter scale uh, uh, wavelengths and devices. Right, right. Um, so I suppose the, the one last question on the actual technology before we, we move on to sort of more broader aspects of quantum computing is in terms of scale up. So in terms of what such a, an iron trap quantum computer could be envisaged to look like when you're talking about a system that contains hundreds of thousands, if not millions of, the, of, of these qubits. Yeah. So, I mean, there are a couple of different ways to answer that. One is, um, maybe that's not the right way to think about the problem. Maybe you don't ever think about building a million ion trap qubits. Maybe you build a system with a few hundred, which is quite conceivable and even within reach. Uh, and with a few hundred, say, on a chip or, or whatnot, um, you can solve some pretty exciting problems in quantum simulation. Um, Matthias Troyer has talked about the Haber process a lot, this process by which you do nitrogen fixation for, um, for ammonia-based fertilizer production. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a very significant industrial chemical process where there are no catalysts, um, and that means it's extremely energy intensive. Uh, he posits that you might be able to, uh, with just a few hundred qubits, solve the problem of, of the, you know, the kind of direct calculation of how to build a catalyst for this process. Um, that's a very exciting prospect because it's within reach on these chip traps where you kind of just move ions around in what's sometimes called the quantum CCD model. That's something developed by Dave Kilpinski and Chris Monroe with Dave some years ago. Um, more broadly, there are architectures developed by, say, Luming Duan and Chris Monroe and Jung Sang Kim, uh, uh, part of a collaboration that I used to be in, um, that looked at um, how do you take some small subset of ions that interact via these uh, phonon modes, the vibrations that I talked about before, Mm -hmm. and couple them with another module that's similar. And and the way that Chris has been doing this is by generating uh, heralded entanglement using photons. So you collect photons from the atoms, and you can make entangled states of atoms that are remote um, by doing the appropriate manipulations on the photons. Um, that's a, it's a very promising architecture in terms of scale up because of the idea of modularity, but obviously these things uh, all have major challenges. Do you have a preference beyond a monolithic design or these sort of optically coupled, um, micro traps? Well, I guess my view is there's pretty much no way I can conceive of doing complete monolithic integration all on a single chip at the scale that you were talking about, millions or whatever. You'll, you'll certainly need things with many chips or off-chip or something as such. And as soon as you start talking about that, I think it becomes sensible to incorporate some kind of uh, remote entanglement generation protocol, which might be done by, by this uh, photonic uh, uh, entanglement. So you think uh, photonic interconnects is definitely the way that uh, things are going to have to move forward if you really want to 
consider scaling up iron traps to, to thousands of qubits? Um, well, th so, so let's be clear. I mean, thousands might be doable using the CCD architecture mm -hmm. um, and shuttling ions around. If you're starting to talk about millions or tens of millions or more, I think it's, it's, that's a very difficult prospect. So that there, um, you know, you have to look at these other remote entanglement protocols. But honestly, I think that problem is almost identical in any technology you pick. You can't build, um, you know, a million superconducting qubits, each one being, you know, three or four cubic centimeters with the associated resonator attached by SMA cables. Uh, these are, you know, these are big challenges of how you hook these things up over big distances. And, and I would say we don't have a very clear answer as a community yet. No, no, no. Scale up is, is a bit difficult with all technologies. That's right. So moving on a bit more sort of globally in terms of, of where the field is now, I mean, Sydney's become kind of a mecca when it comes to quantum technology at the moment. Uh, it seems like announcement after announcement uh, is coming out of either U Sydney, UNSW, UTS, Macquarie. Um, it's really turning into sort of the hub for quantum technology in Australia. Well, that's, that's, it's a very exciting thing. Uh, I'm pleased that uh, you would characterize it that way. It's certainly something we're trying to, uh, to, to emphasize and, and leverage. Uh, you know, I moved to Australia from the States uh, in large part because of the strength here and the potential colleagues I had at the University of Sydney. Uh, great people here, David Riley, who's an experimentalist, uh, Steve Bartlett, who's a theorist, Andrew Doherty, who's a theorist, now Steve Flamia, who's a theorist, and hopefully some, uh, some future hires very soon. Um, but obviously, this is, this is one institution in a city with, with a lot of others. There's great things going on at Macquarie and, of course, UNSW. Uh, Sydney is a very exciting place as a, uh, a hub of uh, development in quantum technology. And, and honestly, you have to give credit to uh, some of my more senior colleagues, but also to members of government many years ago who, uh, who decided to make a strategic investment. Uh, in this area, and you know, UNSW got a lot of, gets a lot of credit for pushing hard on that in in the early stages in the late 1990s. Um, but more recently, in the last say five to eight years, there's been a, a diversification and this development of real strength at Sydney. Um, what you've seen uh, coming out of here uh, recently is the development of a new research facility called the Sydney Nanoscience Hub. Yeah, so I was which about to ask about that. Oh, great! So great timing. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a purpose-built research facility. Uh, obviously, as a university building, it combines research and teaching, which is part of our core mission. Uh, but it is, it is truly purpose-designed for this kind of physics. So we have extremely tight controls on laboratory specifications. Um, you know, the, the labs that were engineered for my group are definitely among the most stable you'll find anywhere on the planet. And I mean, we can quibble about who has the best whatever. Um, but the metrology grade of these... Uh, uh, of the specifications we're talking about are really extraordinary. Tight controls on temperature. The temperature is not allowed to vary by more than a tenth of a degree, mm -hmm. and we actually do better than that by about four times. So 0 0.025 degrees is the peak-to-peak -peak fluctuation you see in temperature. Even with people moving in and out, even with things turning on and off, it's really quite impressive. Also, mechanical vibrations. We've excavated down to bedrock, and the laboratories are all slab on grade, and they're isolated concrete slabs. Um, all of the wiring for the entire building is designed for this kind of research, and all of the submain distribution goes through shielding. So you prevent uh, stray electromagnetic fields mm -hmm. uh, from impacting our labs. The labs are shielded. We have aluminum shielding. We also have active magnetic field cancellation. So if a truck goes by and distorts the Earth's field, you can sense and compensate for that. These are the kinds of things that make challenges we used to have, all the magnetic field drifts and so the qubit transition drifts or the temperature changes and your lasers move around in space because things expand and contract. It relegates those to kind of antiquated problems, right? This is uh, a major investment in research infrastructure that allows us to kind of get on with the science instead of dealing with the fact that the temperature changed and now nothing works again after 20 minutes of realigning the lasers. It's a really exciting investment. Um, it's been a great benefit so far. My group has only recently started moving in, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, you know David's group has been uh, in as well. And uh, we're hoping that we can uh, use this to attract some new talent as well. So, in terms of quantum computing, it's basically yourself working on ion traps and Dave Riley, who who does a lot of stuff in uh, semiconductor physics and control. Um, are you two the only sort of um, quantum computing focused guys at U Sydney uh, on the experimental side? I mean. 
So experimentally right now, uh, David and I run uh, independent collaborative teams, uh, but we are part of this broader uh, quantum physics group. And uh, what's, what's coming very soon and is going to be an extremely exciting announcement is that the university um, is, is initiating what's called the Center for Quantum Machines, which is led out of the University of Sydney uh, by David Riley. Um, my colleagues and I in both theory and experiment are all uh, kind of executive members of this center, and we really want to make this a focal point for research not only in the institution but also in, uh, in the country for, for this kind of uh, experimental and theoretical physics. So, I mean, in terms of your connections to Sydney in general, so you guys, correct me if I'm wrong, you're a part of the ARC Centre for Engineered Quantum Systems, EQUIS. That's um, right. That's whereas right. UNSW uh, head up the Centre for Quantum Computing and Communications Technology. Um, now that's your, right. Your systems are quite different, obviously. The, the UNSW system is looking at silicon. You guys are looking at iron traps. Uh, how much overlap, I mean, how much cross-collaboration is there within Sydney? Well, so, uh, you know, the thing to point out is that these centers get a lot of attention, but they're, it's a funding mechanism. It's one funding mechanism um, in a very diverse portfolio that my colleagues and I bring. So we have U.S. government funding from multiple agencies. David has very strong collaborations with Microsoft. Uh, I've had very strong collaborations with Lockheed Martin. So there are many different places that feed into this, uh, first of all. And Equus is a very strong one, obviously. Uh, in terms of this collaboration, you know, David is also a member of uh, the Center for Quantum Computer Technology led by UNSW in, in its uh, rebid in the current round. Mm -hmm. So there's certainly overlap because David has interest in semiconductor-based uh, quantum bits. Uh, Equus is, is much broader, right? You know, Center for Quantum Computer Technology at UNSW is extremely narrowly focused almost entirely on silicon-based quantum computing. And I mean, they, they have other things going on, but that's really the main focus. Uh, Equus is really based on asking questions about engineered quantum technologies. So what are the engineering questions that have to be addressed to make useful things out of quantum mechanical or quantum coherent devices? Now that certainly includes quantum computing. That includes you know, the many big projects that we have uh, at home and abroad in, in developing ion trap or semiconductor based uh, quantum computing systems, but it also involves the development of uh, sensing technology uh, of quantum simulators, of just asking key questions in, say, the synthesis of uh, artificial quantum uh, many-body systems. Uh, the portfolio that Equus brings is extremely diverse. Uh, it incorporates not just the different technology platforms, but also different applications and questions as well. Right. So the other major announcement that I saw coming out of, of particularly your lab is, is associated with this new project called Logic, which was run out of... Uh, uh, the U.S. Um, intelligence agencies, IARPA. Um, this was quite a big, uh, quite a large amount of funding that you got from these guys. And uh, maybe sort of tell us about what this project uh, entails. Yeah, well, uh, IARPA is an agency in the United States that uh, developed just uh, I don't know, six or seven years ago. Um, and in this particular space has focused on developing multi-qubit systems. So we just concluded a five-year project uh, where I was on a team led by Duke University and the University of Maryland um, looking at what's called multi-qubit coherent operations. So how do you scale up to multiple qubits? What are the science and engineering questions associated with that? And more recently, when that program ended after five and a half years, uh, there was a new program called Logic which is focusing on realizing logical qubits. So these are qubits that are encoded using the techniques of quantum error correction, where our objective is to keep a unstable quantum coherent system alive uh, for a prolonged period and to reach this so-called break-even point, where all the overhead that goes into quantum error correction uh, gives you a, a net benefit for arbitrary errors. Right? This is the important challenge. It's kind of a holy grail. Uh, for the community, there have been lots of demonstrations of um, uh, different elements of quantum error correction and demonstrations that the, the physics works and that you can do some simple protocols, but scaling this up to the generalized error correction at a, at a net gain is a, is a big challenge. Uh, and indeed, uh, my team, my group was lucky enough to be part of an international consortium uh, led out of Europe that is uh, uh, looking to build ion trap based logical qubits. Our objective uh, from my group is to help with some of the quantum control techniques that suppress errors at the physical layer to try and make quantum error correction more efficient at the so-called logical layer. 
So it's a five-year project and they want to hit this, this break-even point. Um, do you think it can be done? I certainly do. I mean, it was very interesting that uh, roughly at the same time of the program announcement about uh, you know uh, who was getting funded, there was a paper that came out of Rob Sholkoff's lab that had a title which was almost the same as the objective of the program. Now, it's a little bit different and it's more specialized and it wouldn't be considered to meet the objective of the program uh, in any rigorous way, but it, it says that there is a huge amount of progress in our community broadly, especially in, in ion trap and superconducting based circuits, uh, which are the two technologies supported in the logic program in a variety of different teams, um, at the scale that's necessary. So of order, let's just call it 10 qubits. Um, that's the scale where you can imagine doing these uh, encoding and uh, error correction processes. Uh, and both platforms are, are very much there, and we, I think it's quite reasonable that in a five-year time scale, uh, the, the key demonstrations for this program will succeed. Oh, great, great. So uh, sort of on a more personal note, um, you, you've sort of been in the media quite a bit. Um, this, this might attest to uh, people's you know, sort of vision of what quantum computing could be and how this impacts the economy in Sydney and the economy of Australia overall. So uh, one notable example is on your, you're on a program called Q&A in Australia, which is uh, run out of the ABC and sort of a political panel discussion program. Um, how did that come about? Uh, well, I, I suppose it, it's true. Um, there's been a, a lot of great media attention. Um, you know, you might unkindly call it uh, overexposure, and I, I'll, I'll wear that criticism. Uh, I think, uh, look, there's a great opportunity right now with uh, some of the politics going on in Australia to focus on homegrown strength in research and technology development. And I legitimately think that uh, quantum technology, including quantum computing, is a real opportunity for strength and ownership in Australia. Obviously, participating as part of a global effort, not just trying to wall it off and do it all locally. That's, I think, impossible. Um, but, you know, this, this strength deserves attention. And um, for good or for ill, uh, I have had some success in conveying that message on behalf of many of my colleagues and in certainly collaboration with them. Um, Q&A came about uh, in part because of the research that my team has done in the past in collaboration with NIST and some of the local things we did on quantum control, uh, led entirely by my group. Um, but with that research background, I've also been heavily engaged in politics, uh, sometimes uh, not, uh, well, sometimes out of necessity. For instance, there was a, a defense bill proposed a couple of years ago that had the potential to completely stifle all research in quantum information by restricting access to lasers and microwave systems and all these things for mm -hmm. military considerations. So I fought that quite publicly um, and it was a very challenging process and it was very kind of difficult career-wise. Uh, we ultimately largely succeeded and uh, I suppose there was some profile building out of that which I appreciate and it earned an opportunity to participate in, in this extremely widely watched uh, panel discussion program where we were talking about innovation and how to support innovation in Australia. Um, the, the key message that I brought uh, was that as the only person there who was doing hardware development, so building stuff, uh, that we need to make sure that our innovation strategy is, uh, is uh, cognizant of the, real, of the need for multiple timescales. If you only invest in short-term startups, uh, then in a few years you run out of new stuff to do. You have to invest in short-term, medium-term translational research and also these longer-term projects that, in fact, may not yield any commercial outcome for decades. Uh, but doing all of this is required. And this message is something that I, I had uh, been speaking about quite publicly. And uh, the producers of Q&A were, were very excited to have a voice uh, to that effect on the program. I mean, certainly being in Japan, I mean, I, I sort of caught bits and pieces of clips of whatever was available. Um, but being here, I, I couldn't sort of gauge the reaction afterwards. So... I mean, how did your appearance land in terms of the, the politics and the public perception of this kind of research in Australia? Well, so I, I did my uh, level best to stay completely out of any political issues. Um, you know, I think uh, if you get bogged down in partisan politics uh, on these topics, everybody loses. These, you know, innovation, technology development, research strength, these are things that any nation benefits from regardless of the ruling party. Mm -hmm. uh, so so I, I worked very hard for that and I, I hope that I came across as a, um, uh, a different voice because it, I was nonpartisan. Um, I did end up having one little jab at um, 
this ongoing debate about the national broadband network, which is the uh, the kind of fiber infrastructure backbone that's uh, being subsidized by the government right now to be to be rolled out to the nation. Uh, many years coming, uh, lots of politics, lots of cost and debates and things like that. And I had a very straightforward comment about you know the underlying technology from a physics perspective, from a technology perspective. Mm. Uh, that of course, you know, it favored one side over the other, honestly, and that was not the intention. I was just trying to talk about the physics, um, but uh, you know, reality is not favorable to all sides always. Uh, that got quite a lot more attention than other things I said. Um, oh, okay. So as soon, as soon as there was a, a hint of, of of a political stance, and that's what took over the coverage. Yeah, the media loved it. They ate it up um, because this is such a hot topic. But I would say broadly, the coverage was extremely favorable to the notion of homegrown research strength. The fact that I legitimately uprooted my life and my family to move to Australia to be part of this extremely strong research community, um, those statements have gone over very well. I mean them sincerely, uh, and I'm very pleased that the reaction was so positive. Oh, wonderful. So in terms of sort of the, the broader global context about um, especially the last 18 to 24 months with this extraordinary level of investment that we're seeing, um, whether it's the, the UK hubs or whether it's the recent announcement of a, of a billion dollar investment in the EU, um, the Canadians, uh, very famously the Canadian Prime Minister Trudeau, um, on I think it was a $50 million uh, grant to Perimeter Institute, and had this wonderful little clip talking about quantum computing, sure. um, all the Americans and the Australians. I mean, do you see this as sort of pushing out of the academic sector and now coming more into... Um, corporations and large-scale conglomerates? I mean, is, is the sort of the research aspect of quantum technology, are we sort of ending that phase? Well, I would certainly not say we're ending the academic phase. Um, uh, it's exciting that there is an emergence of interest in, in the commercial sector, right? I mean, for many years, it was considered that this is p either pie in the sky or just too long time horizon. But now big companies and, and small companies are taking notice, and that's exciting. Um, I think... Uh, if you look carefully at the major investments from the corporate sector, say Google or IBM or Microsoft in quantum information, the kinds of programs that are being run are very academic. Right? Google bought the group of John Martinez, and he was a professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, IBM runs a very academic uh, effort within IBM Research uh, in Yorktown Heights. Uh, Microsoft funds uh, research outposts around the world, uh, including one at Sydney, my colleague David Riley. These are, these are integrating the expertise and capabilities from academia into programs that are larger scale and run by, by the commercial sector. Um, so it's certainly not at a stage where we're just handing over and transitioning. Uh, it's an interesting question as to at what point that might happen. Um, I think there will, for many, many years or even decades, be critical questions that are being addressed uh, in the academic sector, um, but I think you will also see growth in uh, uh, corporate activity in this space, especially as technologies mature for the near-term applications. You mentioned the quantum technology hubs. There's a huge aspect of industrial partnership there, but largely for things that are nearer term, like uh, clocks, sensors, gravimeters, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, those are, are excellent applications of quantum coherent technology. They have great commercial appeal, they have the right time scales, and support for those efforts may well lead to uh, broader developments in, in quantum computing down the road. So, I mean, we're getting close to sort of our 45-minute uh, maximum that I like to try and do on these podcasts. So uh, the final sort of technical question that I'll ask, and I'm, I'm trying to ask everyone this, even though most people don't want to answer, um, is to sort of gain some kind of prediction from you in the next five to ten years. And then I, I said to Seth yesterday, I said, there's a, there's a bottle of whiskey if we come back in five or ten years' time to whoever got closest um, and to where you see uh, quantum computing and active quantum technology being in the next five years, the next ten years. So you want to take a stab at it? Oh, I'm happy to do so. This has been a great conversation, so I'll play the game. Uh, <laughs> uh, it depends on what kind of whiskey, though. Um, something it's, Japanese it's, would be very nice. It's the choice of whoever wins. All right. Nika from the barrel is my choice. Wonderful. Um, so I would say that, uh, let, let's, let's phrase it this way. Uh, over the next 10 years, I would strongly anticipate that we will see uh, mesoscale quantum computing devices at the scale of 50 to 100 
let's call it, let's call it in 10 years, 100 qubits um, with uh, very significant levels of control, perhaps just individual control over each, uh, over each qubit, performing uh, quantum simulation, either digital or analog, uh, for problems in, say, chemical, uh, chemistry, material science, uh, or the like. Um, in addition, you will certainly see continued developments on things like the chip scale atomic clock and all these kind of existing quantum technologies, gravimetry, AOSense is a great company doing things like this. Uh, all those things will continue and there will be these incremental advances. Um, but then, uh, you know, building large scale quantum computers is a, is a longer term effort. So I'm not going to speculate on that. Okay. Well, well, we'll see how close you are to being correct in 10 years if we're both still around. I hope I am. <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, so finally, is there anything that you, you want to plug, anything specific going on with your group or Sydney in general, any programs or events coming up that you, that you want to mention? Well, just broadly, I'm, I'm excited about the fact that Sydney is becoming recognized uh, as, a, as a city and an institution, in particular at the University of Sydney, uh, with real broad-based strength in this. We're very excited to be making hires. We're very excited to make uh, junior hires in the future. So we do hope that people who are interested in working at the cutting edge of experimental quantum science and theoretical as well uh, have an interest. Uh, we're also broadly excited about this new Center for Quantum Machines uh, that will be led here, ask, asking questions really at this physics engineering interface. How do you uh, leverage what we know about quantum systems to, to help build control systems for mesoscale or large scale uh, quantum machines? Uh, that kind of are maximally efficient. Uh, we, we have a lot of work in that in my group. How do you control quantum systems and make them useful? Uh, how do you suppress decoherence? These kinds of physics slash engineering questions are the things that we're very excited to work on. Uh, and, and, you know, we're really looking to make a contribution to the broad-based global effort. Great. So I think we'll call it quits here. Um, I'll put a link uh, down in the descriptions on, on all the accounts that I upload this to, to both uh, the group website of Mike Beerchuk and also his Twitter account, MJ, at MJ Beerchuk. He's on a bit of a, you're on a bit of a follower hunt at the moment, aren't you? Uh, well, it's, it, it's kind of, it was a bit of a joke, but um, after getting trolled a bit last night, uh, I'm not sure that I want to continue talking about it. I am, I am you know, new to Twitter. And uh, I'm giving it a try. It's not, um, you know, something that I find is a, a very natural means of communication, but it certainly has some benefits that I'm trying to embrace in terms of scientific outreach. Yeah, I think you've just got to handle it with kid gloves, and I think you'll be fine. Yes. So thanks again, Mike, for, for joining us today and, and tolerating all of the, the rubbish that happened with the, with the Google stream. Um, obviously, as soon as this is finished, I'll, I'll upload it to YouTube and all the other accounts, so it'll be there. But... Uh, I suppose there's not much we can do if Google just doesn't want to cooperate. No, sometimes Google plays along and sometimes it has a mind of its own. But thank you so much for having me. It's really been a fun conversation. Yeah, no problem at all. Thanks again, Mike. Thank you. Cheers.